Europe was on the verge of widespread change. But hope for the Reformation seemed to have been extinguished at the stake following the burning of Wycliffe's bones and the very public deaths of Jan Hus and Jerome of Prague. The state church was determined to wipe out all heretics who dared to express a different opinion and hurled armies at the reformed states of Bohemia, sparking the Hussite Wars. The Church of Rome rejoiced that the heretics were silenced forever. But this illusion was not to last. The people's thirst for the enlightening doctrines was not to be quenched. The prophecy of Hus predicting a coming swan that could be neither boiled nor roasted was nearing fulfillment. Join us as we uncover the heroic lives of those who led out in this movement and changed the world forever. This is the story of Light Unshackled. On November 10, 1483, Martin Luther was born here in Eisleben, Germany. His parents were poor German peasants who desired a better life for their son through great sacrifice. They sent him to the university to become a lawyer. Luther was a natural student and excelled in his studies. He would have walked through this arch to enter the university library. One day, while Luther was examining the books, he came across an entire Latin Bible. Up to this point, he didn't even know that a whole Bible existed. He had only heard portions of the Gospels and Psalms recited by the priests. He stood in awe, holding not just a few passages, but the entire Bible. His soul stirred within him and he thought, oh, that God would give me such a book for myself. This was quite possibly the beginning of his desire to make the Bible available to the common person in their own language. In 1505, Luther was traveling back to Erfurt where he was attending school when a massive thunderstorm blew in. He fought to press on, but fear gripped him as he remembered that a friend had been killed by lightning. In terror, he cried out, Save me, Saint Anne, and I'll become a monk! The storm abated, and Luther did indeed survive. He kept his promise, and much to his father's dismay, left law school to join a monastery. Luther's entire life had been filled with fear. Like many living in the Dark Ages, he was terrified of demons and of supernatural activity. In a desperate attempt to find peace, he entered a monastery. Perhaps there he could find genuine rest for his soul. In the monastery, Luther spent hours in confession, and when he was finished, he would start all over again. Finally, his confessor, Father Stoutpitz, had had enough. Look, he said, if you want Christ to forgive you, come with something to forgive. He assured Luther that his sins had been forgiven, that he had peace in Jesus Christ. But Luther's mind still troubled him. One day, while walking through the library, Luther came across a book containing Jan Hus' sermons. Intrigued, he said, I could not understand for what cause they had burnt so great a man who explained the Bible with so much gravity and skill. Several years after joining the monastery, Luther was sent to Rome on official business. He and another monk made the 800-mile journey on foot, staying at monasteries along the way. Rome was a culture shock. Here was immeasurable wealth, luxury, and levity. Everywhere he turned, he found profanity in the place of sanctity. Well, in Rome, Luther visited many of the holy sites, including Pilate's staircase. The church taught that anyone who ascended these stairs on their knees would receive a full pardon for any sins that had been committed. As Luther ascended each stair, about halfway up, the verse came vividly to his mind from Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. The just shall live by faith. 
as the light illuminated his mind, Luther understood for the first time that it wasn't his works that would save him, but Jesus Christ alone. Around this time, St. Peter's Basilica was under construction in Rome. The Pope's extravagant lifestyle had emptied the treasury and church leaders decided to use a creative and effective fundraising tool. They would print paper indulgences for sale. Half of the income would go to the local bishop in Germany, and the other half of the proceeds would go to Rome. To sell these indulgences, the church would send emissaries of the Pope to encourage people to buy. Johann Tetzel was sent to Saxony, Germany, near Wittenberg. Johann Tetzel was a master salesman. He traveled to various parts of Germany and preached on the horrors of purgatory and also on the graciousness of the church to offer pardon and forgiveness for so little money. Why, he would say, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. And then he would ask, how could anyone be so selfish that they would not relieve their deceased relatives from the terrible suffering in purgatory? The ignorant and superstitious, plagued by fears of death and torment, eagerly accepted this offer. Money poured into the treasury as people paid to have their sins forgiven and their relatives freed from purgatory. To Luther, this was simply religious manipulation. And here was the problem with indulgences. It didn't bring about any heart change. Well, in theory, a person was supposed to demonstrate signs of repentance. The system was poised for corruption. Tetzel was to discover this firsthand in Leipzig, Germany. A man asked if it was possible to buy an indulgence for a future sin. Tetzel assured him this was not a problem with the payment of a large sum of money. The man paid and left with the indulgence and the official seal of the Pope. As Tetzel left the town, he was attacked and beaten, and the large chest of money was stolen. Tetzel was enraged and demanded the thief be brought to justice. However, when brought before the magistrate, the man proved to be the same one who had purchased an indulgence earlier for a future sin. He assured the magistrate that this was the sin he had intended when he purchased it. Much to the chagrin of Tetzel, the man was allowed to go free. The idea of purchasing the forgiveness of sins, past or future, was in Luther's mind something of pagan origin and not to be found anywhere in the Bible. He preached to his congregations with increasing conviction that all their beliefs must be based upon the Bible. Large crowds came to hear him preach, but preaching was not enough. Christianity and the church were about to be shaken to their core. In 1517, Duke Frederick, Elector of Saxony, had an incredible dream. He saw a monk nailing something to a church door with letters so large you could read it from a great distance. The monk used a goose quill to write, and the quill became a beam that grew large and reached to Rome, knocking the triple crown off the Pope's head. In the dream, men tried to break the pen but it was like steel and could not be broken. Then he saw other pens riding all around. The Duke had this continuing dream three times that fretful night and finally awoke to the morning of October 31st, 1517. Luther made his way to the castle church door here in Wittenberg, Germany a piece of paper in his hand. On it, he outlaid 95 points or theses, arguing that indulgences were not to be found in the teachings of Jesus or even within the Bible. His intent was to generate discussion within Wittenberg. Little did he realize what an impact this paper would have, not just on Wittenberg, but all of Christendom. In a few days, it had spread throughout Germany, and in a few weeks, 
it had spread across all of Europe. One new machine made it all possible, the printing press. Thousands of copies of the 95 Theses were quickly printed and distributed among the people. The points became the talk of all Germany. What was so startling about this document? Why was it so revolutionary? Over the last 1500 years, the church had become the final authority on religion and doctrine. Luther was striking at the very foundation of state church structure. In July of 1519, Johann Eck debated Luther in order to challenge his teachings. Eck was considered to be the master debater in Germany. In the debate, Luther stated that the scripture alone was the basis of Christian belief. He condemned the sale of indulgences as a means of reducing time in purgatory, as there was no mention of purgatory in the Bible. When the theologians saw that they could make no progress with Luther, the Pope sent out an order, excommunicating him and commanding that his books and pamphlets be burned. Upon receiving the condemning document, Luther, along with fellow professors and students, gathered underneath this tree and burned the papal excommunication letter. The battle was on. The Emperor, a supporter of the Pope, summoned Luther to appear before his court in Worms, Germany. The building has since been destroyed, but this is the place where Martin Luther would have stood before the court. A table in front of him contained all his writings. The court demanded that he recant. He trembled, and in a subdued voice asked for more time to be able to give a response. He was given until the next day. He spent hours that night in prayer. It felt like the world was standing against him. Finally, the morning came. He was ushered into the chamber, and a response was demanded. All was hushed as Luther spoke. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of Holy Scripture, or by evident reason, for I can believe neither Pope nor councils alone, as it is clear that they have erred repeatedly and contradict themselves. I consider myself convicted by the testimony of Holy Scripture, which is my basis. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. Thus I cannot, and I will not recant, because acting against one's conscience is neither safe nor sound. God help me. Amen. I can imagine the silence in the room, one man bravely standing on the authority of the Bible against the most powerful men on earth. His courageous manner impressed many that were present, but his reasoning fell on the deaf ears of church leadership. Luther was declared to be an outlaw. His accusers urged the emperor to arrest Luther on the spot. After all, they said, faith need not be kept with heretics. But Emperor Charles remembered when Emperor Sigismund had violated the safe conduct for Huss and replied, I should not like to have to blush like Sigismund. As Luther traveled home, he was secretly kidnapped and secluded in a mountain fortress, the Warper Castle. Frederick, the Elector of Saxony, who had had the miraculous dream of a monk nailing something to the door of a church, had determined to save his friend. It was here, in this room, that Luther translated the entire New Testament into German. In just 11 weeks, he accomplished one of his greatest life goals, to give his people the scriptures in their language. Luther's disappearance caused quite a stir. Rumors wildly circulated. Some thought he was dead. His enemies rejoiced. But as his new publishings came off the press, it became clear that he was not dead, but alive. 
However, with Luther physically hidden away, a dark and sinister shadow began to fall across the Reformation movement. A peasant revolt swept through the countryside, and the enemies of the Reformation were quick to blame it on the teachings of Martin Luther. The Reformation was on the verge of falling apart. Torn from within and opposed from without, Luther could no longer stay hidden. He left the castle without protection and entered the pulpit, preaching, rebuking, and encouraging his followers. The Reformation was saved, but opposition from the state church was far from over. The next movements would determine the future of Europe and the world. In 1526, the Imperial Diet met for the first time in Spire, Germany. The leaders from across the country met here in the Spire Cathedral to discuss important decisions, one of which was the spread of the Reformation. Emperor Charles V knew that he would have to walk a very delicate line. He, along with the state church, was desirous to snuff out the Reformed heresy. But he also knew that some of the princes were pushing for freedom to practice religion as their conscience dictated. The fledgling Reformation hung in the balance. To protect the Reformation, God raised up an unlikely ally from the East. The Ottoman Turks were advancing towards Europe. Every kingdom had fallen before them. Seventy-five years before the Imperial Diet, Constantinople had fallen to the Turks. This was significant in the European mind as Constantinople was considered the queen of cities because of its advanced fortifications. For over a thousand years, these walls had stood unbreached. A massive chain would be hauled across the harbor to prevent any ships from being able to attack from the sea. No matter how the city was approached, it was considered to be impregnable. That is, until the Ottoman Turks attacked. One of the original cannons used to destroy Constantinople still exists today. And I've traveled to Fort Nelson in England to see it. The Turks advanced on Constantinople. They came with the largest cannon that had ever existed up to that point. 17 feet long, it could shoot projectiles that weighed up to 670 pounds over a mile in distance. As they arrived, I can imagine the terror that the inhabitants must have felt as they looked over the wall and saw the massive army of the Turks who gathered around with these huge cannons beginning to shake and destroy their wall. Even now, as the Diet was taking place, the Ottoman Turks were sweeping north and nearing the borders of Charles V's empire. At the Battle of Mohawks, the Hungarian army had been destroyed. There was no longer a buffer between the fierce Ottoman Empire and the rest of Europe. The Emperor had made up his mind. Luther had already been outlawed. The Reformation must be stopped. But as long as the Turks were advancing, Charles V needed the cooperation and military support of the Protestant princes, and he was forced to tolerate their reforms to save his kingdom. In 1529, another serious threat was to be encountered. The Diet met again, and a law was proposed that would allow the reformed areas to remain reformed. However, the spread of biblical doctrines to other areas would be prohibited. Well on the surface, this appeared to be a concession. The reformed leaders realized that if truth could not spread, it would die. Many Germans, even under Catholic princes, had accepted the Reformed doctrine. If these restrictions were implemented, civil war was imminent. The Reformed German princes put their life and lands on the line as they respectfully but forcefully lodged a formal protest against the edict. 
They said, let us reject this decree. In matters of conscience, the majority has no power. The proposed laws failed. Charles saw that his plans had been thwarted again. He needed these princes and their men to fight against the Turks. The term Protestant was coined in honor of these princes who protested against the unfair laws. Through an unexpected source, the Reformation had been protected once again. If the Ottoman Turks had not been pressing from the east, the Reformation could have been crushed. While the advancement of the Turks was checked during the Siege of Vienna in 1529, their continued presence distracted the armies and allowed the flickering flame of the Reformation to become a steady blaze. In England, another giant of faith was rising in the early 1500s. This man would significantly shape the English language and religion perhaps more than any other. His name was William Tyndall. In 1494, Tyndall was born here in Gloucestershire, England, an area dominated by the wool industry. He grew up among farmers and textile workers. It was this humble beginning that laid the foundation for his future success. He attended Oxford University, where he received one of the finest educations available in his day. Tyndall moved back to Gloucestershire, England, and became a tutor for the Welsh family. His hosts would often have the leading men of the city over, and Tyndall loved to sit down with them and discuss the new ideas which were sweeping through Europe. One evening, he was discussing with a group of monks when one of them said, that he would rather have the laws of the Pope than the Bible. Tyndall was appalled and heatedly responded, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spares my life ere these many years, I will translate a Bible into English so that the plowboy may know more scripture than you. Little did they realize how Tyndall, the lowly son of a farmer, was destined to shape the English language, perhaps more than any other. After the fall of Constantinople, documents began to flow west as people fled from the advancing Turks. As these manuscripts arrived in Western Europe, there was a renewed interest in Greek and Hebrew. Scholars wanted to study the Bible in its original language. One of them, Erasmus, compiled the many Greek New Testament versions into one compilation. He published this as a single New Testament with Greek and Latin side by side. This was invaluable to Tyndall as he translated the Bible into English. As Tyndall continued his study and translation of the Bible, tension with local religious authorities rose, and in order to avoid the charge of heresy, Tyndall fled to London, where he hoped to get permission to publish a Bible in English. In London, he asked Tunstall, who was Bishop of Durham, for permission to publish his Bible. But Tunstall was a strong believer that the Bible should not be in the language of the people. He let Tyndall know, in no uncertain terms, that his Bible was not welcome in London, and made sure to shut every other door for publishing as well. With legal permission denied, Tyndall decided to go underground. Within a short time, he had boarded a ferry and left England, never to return. He must have known this would make him a hunted man for the rest of his life. Once in Europe, Tyndall was constantly moving, translating long hours each day and in continual danger of capture. In 1525, he completed the New Testament and started printing 3,000 copies in Cologne. Unfortunately, the printer shop was raided and Tyndall barely escaped with his life managing to save some of the pages of the translated work. He traveled to the city of Worms to finish. Finally, he was able to print it. His Bible, though it was expensive, was an instant bestseller. Because of the invention of the printing press, it no longer took 11 months to copy the Bible by hand. Now, a Bible could be produced in a matter of days. Soon, much to the distress of the authorities, Tyndall's New Testament started showing up in England. Merchants were smuggling them in containers filled with food and wool. 
even though they were expensive. People bought them as soon as they became available. They were small and easily fit inside your pocket. This was important, as owning one always came at the risk of losing your life. The state church, in a desperate attempt to keep Tyndall's Bible away from the people, bought up hundreds of copies and brought them here to St. Paul's Cathedral in London to be burned. But the proceeds from these sales were sent back to Tyndall, who used them to print even more Bibles. In 1535, Tyndall was betrayed by a man he trusted. He was captured near his residence by officers of Charles V. In Villevorde, Tyndall was imprisoned under deplorable conditions. We still have a letter that he wrote to the prison warden asking for warmer clothes, oil for his lamp, and his books so that he could continue translating the Old Testament. Finally, after 15 months of imprisonment, he was led from his cell to be burned. He was led to the stake, the wood was piled around him, and the fire was lit. His final words were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. When he'd finished burning, they scooped up his ashes and threw them into the river behind me. And why did they burn him? For translating the Bible into English. Within four years, Tyndall's dying prayer was answered. In England, Miles Coverdale was able to publish the Coverdale Bible, based almost entirely on Tyndall's work. In 1539, King Henry VIII authorized the publishing of the Great Bible, the first authorized Bible in English history. In 1611, King James Version, the most famous Bible of all times, was published. Over 84% of the King James New Testament is Tyndall's work. 75% of the Old Testament books that Tyndall was able to translate found its way directly into the King James Version. In it was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The Reformers, such as Martin Luther and William Tyndall, shared one great desire, that the Bible be made available not just to the priests and the monarchs, but also to the common plowboy. The shadows of the Dark Ages were lifting as people were able to read the Bible for themselves. <laughs>